Before I begin this episode, I'm just going to mention for the purposes of the audience, I'm not hitting a wall in terms of inspiration, but it has become work to come up with episode concepts and subjects. Now, that's just normal, because after 112 episodes, each of them involving sometimes multiple subjects and events, and my dedication to not repeating myself, or at least not knowingly repeating myself, I'm going to hit a point where I'm not going to have something very obvious to find. To that extent, if you're a fan or somebody who's kept track of my work, and there's some part of my life that you do not recall me talking about on this podcast, and you want more information about it, well, this is your moment to step up. Either reach me on text files on Twitter, come to jason at textfiles.com, which is my email address for everything, and let me know if there's something out there you think this podcast should cover. But before I run out completely, let me talk about an incredible bounty. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. One of the advantages to being known as the Angel of Death he who stands over the destruction of web and online history, is that I've learned to really appreciate what we have now. Places, events, people that are here with us now that we are benefiting from and which may not always be there forever. If I visit a place that means a lot to me, I walk around it a few times. I try to really soak it in to understand what I'm looking at. If it's something that I didn't know was there, I will again spend extra time, far beyond just buying something and walking out, or getting the thing I need and walking out. I will take photographs. I will investigate every corner, just because I know it may never exist again. There was a wonderful arcade on the outskirts of Denver, Colorado, that I visited with my friend Rob, and I saw that it was really unique and weird, but I wondered how long it could possibly survive. It was in a building that was more like a warehouse. They had painted video game symbols on the parking lot, and inside was something I'd never really seen before in a retro arcade. They had rooms set aside that looked like living rooms that had Apple IIs and home consoles that you could go in, sit down, get a drink, and act like you were in some sort of basement from decades ago. They also had a gigantic room of old video games, really almost a hundred, that would be the wondrous alleys of entertainment and attraction that I recall from my youth. Everything about it said this will either stick around forever or it won't last much longer. They recently closed just before opening to filming for some sort of project, but that was it. That memory was gone. But I had worked my way around the room, absorbed the interesting neon signs in the arrangement, took photographs, and it lives within me, along with everybody else who was gifted with the presence of that arcade over its short lifetime. There was an arcade named Rusty Quarters in Minneapolis that I filmed for the arcade documentary. I interviewed the owner. He talked about his ideas and why he was trying it again. And I got some really good footage, and then they were gone. And you know, I don't just mean to focus on arcades. There are bookstores and parks and buildings and companies and individuals who are with us now that we appreciate and talk to and make part of our lives, and then they're gone. So, in that spirit, let me say that right now, the Internet Archive is experiencing a cornucopia, an unending supply of computer 
video game, and technological history. People have internalized it. Take the paper, the photos, the data that was part of your childhood, part of your present day, and get it up to the Internet Archive where we'll make it readable, make it emulated, make it available for everybody else. There are thousands of items being uploaded to the archive every day, and hundreds of those each week are what I would call vintage computer artifacts. Either magazines or posters or manuals, disk images, combinations of ROMs and overlays and side art, things that were so hard to get your hands on just a few years ago are now flooding in in such volume that I know that no single person is even aware of how much is coming in. I'm certainly not. One of my jobs at the Internet Archive is to clean up the spam and vandalism that comes in when you're completely open to the world. As a result, that takes up a good portion of my time. And in evaluating who's coming in and what they're doing, I happen to be catching some of what's going on. What's interesting, of course, is when somebody uploads just one kind of thing. There's a guy who was uploading just scanned images of pogs, the milk caps that you would play games with that were really popular in the 1990s. Well, he's been uploading thousands of them. There's also been people who will upload a very specific genre of music or will have live music recordings or will have recordings of bird song or romance novels, found film, Japanese television shows of the 1980s. There are people who just upload their one single thing. And once you figure out what they are, I can make everything they're uploading go to that collection. But then there's the people who upload a wide variety of things, usually within some realm of interest, but not always. Maybe they upload some magazines and then scans of tape along with some napkins or images of notebooks or it's in a weird file format and only doing some research will I find out that it's a version of MIDI that nobody uses or a reclassification of zip files to have some bizarre uh, custom edition that only works with a certain client. I mean, it could be anything and I'm not omniscient. And with that amount of stuff coming in, and all my other duties, sometimes it'll be weeks or months before I see something. What a paradise we walk through in this world to be able to sit back with your computer with a nice big screen and a relatively decent cable modem and connect to the archive and bring forth items that would normally be stuck in the bottom of someone's file cabinet, socked away in an attic, or maybe nowhere to be found at all and to be able to read them in full resolution, to magnify where you want to see more detail, and maybe be inspired to copy and paste them to your friends and share in it, and then to see something, some detail, maybe an ad for a game you've never heard of, and then start doing research on that address of that company and find out the whole story of what was there. This happens to me all the time. I will be fascinated at a company that has a computer-shaped chocolate bar. And I'll say to myself, how did you exist? And are you elsewhere on the archive? And I can search for their address, or I can look at the name of the product and see where else it's mentioned. Do the research. Find a backstory. And maybe somewhere in there, the chapters link up. I find out they renamed themselves, and we now know the name of that company, but it's in a completely different industry. Recently, a friend of mine was showing me a rather odd Commodore 64 screen that mentioned a studio, and using the archive, I found an obscure digitized book from 1990 that mentioned that studio and the person who ran it, and within a short time, my friend was able to write to that artist 
in 2020 and start a conversation that may end with interviews, additional artifacts, or maybe just a fun story. I notice that I'm using the term happiness and cornucopia here because where I come from, research, learning, and making connections is itself a delight. It's like reading the footnotes of a story or book that you know well and getting a whole new perspective. I read Compute Magazine and Creative Computing and a lot of other magazines when I was in my teens, but I didn't fully understand the context of what I was looking at, who was publishing what, what commercial interests were involved, what deals were being made behind the scenes. All of that was opaque to me. All I saw were the designs, the drawings, the people making promises, promises I assumed they could keep. And with limited funds, it wasn't like I was going to be buying any of it. It all just existed in my mind as dreams. Dreams that have stuck with me forever. To this day, I still get a chill when I see uh, a rainbow or multi-stripe design from the 1970s or 1980s. There's something about that aesthetic that just brings me back, makes me feel safe, like I'm in a New York summer and I'm 11 years old. That's my deal. I know that buried in these piles of incoming scanned items are similar treasures and memories for others. I'd like to do more to make them available. I've written scripts over the years. They do all sorts of analysis and they try to find themes and build up collections from them. But it's never going to be perfect. Every once in a while, I'll find a new cache that I didn't know was inside of the archive's incoming folders because I didn't know that was a term, or I didn't think to look inside of a zip file for a bunch of PDFs of magazines and folders and newsletters from one particular place. People were not given a whole lot of instructions to upload to the archive. They drag the folder in, they think they're done. Description, metadata, it's kind of optional the way we do it. And one of the ways that we have trouble down the line is trying to figure out what exactly did this person upload? Where did this come from? Was it the original creator? Did they find a collection somewhere else? So I'm always on the hunt, always kind of sitting by the river of incoming material to see what else might be missed? What else might have a second or third life in research and entertainment and nostalgia? Whatever happens in the future to myself, to the archive, to the audience, to discs, I know that at this moment, this shining, beautiful moment, we have been given a treasure that we could have only dreamed about 20, 30, 40 years ago. The road extends infinitely. The possibilities defy quantification. Maybe after you're done hearing my voice here, you can put down the headphones, turn off the speaker, go to archive.org slash details slash open source, and just let it wash all over you. Let the discovery begin. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Forrest Fuqua, James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Scott McGrady, Scott Roseanne, Wayne Arthurton, Joshua Stein, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. By the way, if you're a little worried that I mention about subjects becoming more and more difficult, Please don't worry too much. I just have to sit down, quantify things, look back over blog posts and emails and conversations, and I'm sure I'll have plenty for some time to come. But I always know that people take an interest in things differently than I do, and I would love to encourage the voices out there to reach out to me, and don't worry, you're not bothering me to give me ideas for episodes coming up. So 
I'll make an episode about it. Thank you for the idea. And maybe we'll both learn something together.